there. I'm Susan Miller. I'm with New Westminster Community Television. That's URL newwest.tv. I'll tell you again about that at the end of the program. Today I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story of vision, struggle, persistence, a big win, more struggle, and now new threats. It's a story that's ranged over decades. It's a story about salmon, coho, chum, pink, they came back in the thousands to the Burnett River, the river you're seeing behind me, not so very long ago. Um, the Burnett River has a history, or had a history, of being one of the best small rivers for salmon in the Lower Mainland going way back uh, into the 1800s. As a matter of fact, there are newspaper files from the um, uh, local city newspapers in the early 1900s, and I think you can still find those files in the New Westminster Library, that talk about the fact that there were so many fish coming back up the Burnett River that they were practically pushing each other up on the banks. That's how many there were, and this would be in the early 1900s. It's the story of the Sapperton Fish and Game Club that brought back this urban river from death against all odds. By the 1960s, um, there were virtually no salmon coming back up the Burnett River at all. The salmon run was extinct. Sapperton Fish and Game Club um, was made up mostly of people who lived in Sapperton and worked in Sapperton. And that's why it got the name Sapperton Fish and Game Club. And the members of the Sapperton Fish and Game Club remembered as kids, most of them living in the Sapperton area and growing up there, remembered as kids um, living and swimming and playing in the river in the summer and fishing and they were appalled at the state that the river had fallen to. And so they decided in um, 1969, the club itself was formed in about 1961, they decided in 1969 to take it on as a community project to see what they could do to try and restore the river to some semblance of, what, of how they had remembered it as kids and I'm talking about the 1920s and the 1930s, and we're talking about the 1960s now. It was 15 years later, after a valiant effort on the part of the club and powerful allies that they had gained along the way, that they found victory. It was 1984, and Elmer Rudolph had just joined the club. The club meeting was the very next day. So I went to the club meeting, and I stood up and I said, I don't know whether anybody's been down there, but I was down there walking yesterday, and I think there are salmon in the Burnett River. And everybody jumped up and said, where? So I told them where, and the next day there were a lot of club members walking up and down the Burnett River, very excited to see, after, all, after 15 years of effort, the first coho coming back. So that's, what, uh, that's how I happened to be in, involved with it. But I was a very late comer, just joining in 1984 when they first came back. Uh, but other club members had been working for 15 years to get them there. That's not the end of the story. There was still a lot of work to do to keep the Burnett River clean and livable. And the fish have been coming back consistently since. Elmer will tell you the full story, but first you're gonna hear about the current threats to the river. The first threat is the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which is to bring bitumen from Alberta to Tidewater in British Columbia. The proposed route for the Trans Mountain Pipeline runs parallel to the Burnett River for about three kilometers. And it, it varies in distance anywhere from about 30 meters in one spot. Admittedly, it's only for a very short distance, but it, it comes within about 30 meters in one spot. Average is 150 to 250 meters away from the river, which might sound like that's not too bad. Unfortunately, uh, in that three kilometers that the pipeline parallels the river, it crosses five streams that are tributary to the Burnett River. So if there was a leak or a spill in that pipeline, anywhere near any of those five streams, the water, the, the pollutants would probably enter those streams, enter the aquifer of those streams and eventually make its way into the Burnett River and we've got ourselves a problem. Um, we, we were invited by Trans Mountain Pipeline to lots of workshops over the past five years when they were talking about this route. 
And we brought this to their attention. We said, um, you, you uh, obviously agree that this pipeline is going through an environmentally sensitive area when it parallels the Burnett River. Oh, yes, we agree to that. Um, we said, okay, what, are your, what is your response to putting a pipeline through a, uh, um, an environmentally sensitive area? And they said, we increased the diameter, the thickness of the pipeline, I think he said approximately four millimeters. And I said, is that it? That, that's, that's your standard response? That's our standard response to going through an environmentally sensitive area. We increased the thickness of the pipeline by about four millimeters. And at this, uh, at this workshop, I suggested that, well, for an area, for this three kilometer area, because it's so highly sensitive, would you consider putting one pipe inside another? So that if you did get a spill along this three kilometer area where these five creeks are that you cross, the, the oil would be contained inside the outside pipe and this would save everything. Well, no, because that would be too expensive. Uh, I understand it would be expensive, but uh, consider the expense of cleaning it up if there was a, a bad spill into the river. Well, there was no response to that. I got the figures about how much it would cost to build it, the pipeline and what the cost would be to build a pipeline, uh, the, the three kilometer area beside the Burnett River. And I calculated that if they were to double the, uh, the, the piping in that three kilometer area, the increase in the cost for the entire project from Alberta right down to the Tidewater and the Bernard Inlet would be about one half of 1%. So I said, well, for one half of 1%, you're not prepared to, um, to uh, take that extra step. Well, no, they weren't. So that was the end of that. Well, they've said that they're going to take all kinds of uh, precautions when they build it, of course. I'm sure there's going to be an environmental, uh, they've hired an, env uh, an environmental company uh, that would have uh, monitors there watching to make sure how everything is done, which is fine. It all sounds good. But really, we have seen, we have seen many projects built in the watershed of the Burnett River over the last many years that supposedly were done with environmental consultants and all the rest of it and they haven't been they haven't been very successful in maintaining their the runoff the dirty water runoff from their construction sites which is supposed to be filtered and it ends up being filtered for a week or two and then the filtering doesn't work but the environmental consultant never makes them do anything about it so we're not particularly confident in the roles that environmental consultants play uh, in, during these, during these uh, situations. And there's another threat, not surprisingly related to fossil fuel, climate change. The, one of the big concerns we have is what with climate change? Uh, we're finding that we're getting uh, drier periods when the, what, when the water levels in the streams go down to sometimes alarmingly low levels and we're trying to we're trying to raise juvenile fish in there, but the waters go down to alarmingly low levels. And then other times, of course, when you get multiple days of heavy rains and the, and the streams come way up, and the rain is so heavy, it brings not only runoff into the streams, d dirty water runoff, which is harmful to the fish, but it also creates such a volume of water that the fish sometimes get swept downstream despite their fact that they're trying to find sanctuaries they get swept downstream right out of their native stream and right into the Burnett River and possibly even all the way down the river and, and out into the Fraser River and and they will lose their natural habitat and probably not survive then if they're juveniles not survive to become adults so this climate change is a big problem um, don't know what we can do about it what we can do what we can do, and we're thinking more and more about this, is to provide, is to build sanctuaries into our streams so that, uh, so that they will not only store water and uh, bring the water levels up in low water levels, but also provide sanctuaries out of stream, out of the mainstream flow, where we can have little sanctuaries, back eddies and whatnot, where they can go for safety um, during the high water periods. So that's the kind of thing that's, I would say, our, our, newest, our newest concern. Now for the fascinating and heroic story about getting the salmon to come back to the Burnett River, so very poignant given the current threats. In 1969, the Saperton Fish and Game Club 
having decided to take on this project, got started. First thing they did was they went to um, all the um, all the uh, industries that were on the lower part of the uh, Burnett River, which were in which were um, incidentally basically responsible for the pollution on the Burnett River and why the fish couldn't make it up. Uh, there were a whole series of companies in the lower part of the Burnett River that were that had um, sighted there probably in the 1920s. 1930s, there were sawmills, there was a, uh, an outfit uh, that made um, veneer, there was a distillery, there was a slaughterhouse, and all these companies basically got rid of their waste by pouring it through a pipe into the Burnett River. That was their way they got rid of their waste. And uh, starting in the 1920s, gradually the pollution of the lower part of the river got worse and worse, to the point where when the fish came up, they could not pass through that lower part of the Burnett, the polluted river, to get up to the upper part of the river, which was in reasonably good condition. So, the club members uh, approached the management of these companies and said, this is what we would like to do and we would like you to help us out if you could. And one of the things you need to do is you need to stop putting your waste into the Burnett River. This is the big problem. And the response was uh, decidedly negative. They said, well, we, we, that would cost us a lot of money to begin with to do that. And secondly, nobody is making us do it. Nobody is telling us we can't do this. So we'll continue doing it. And of course, that was the problem. We don't know whether there were fisheries laws at the time in terms of protecting rivers if there were they certainly weren't being they certainly weren't being enforced so we decided okay we'll do what we can we went to the uh, greater vancouver regional district which metro vancouver was called at the time and said look if we take all the visible garbage out of the river that we can will you at least haul it away and they said we'll do that so members uh, went into the river and we hauled out if you can believe rusty bed springs old stoves that were thrown away, big truck tires, refrigerators that were thrown into the river and just... So we hauled all that stuff up out of the bank, onto the bank, and it was carried away by the uh, GVRD vehicles. And at least it looked like a river instead of a moving garbage dump. So we, uh, so we did what we could, but I have to admit we did not make much progress through the early 1970s. Uh, we we uh, sent around information, pamphlets to uh, uh, people that lived in the area, that lived in the watershed and said, you know, please don't put polluting uh, d uh, materials down your storm drains and things like that to help. So we did what we could. But the big break for us came in the late 1970s. Uh, the federal government had become alarmed at the uh, low, number, low numbers of coho salmon that were returning up the Fraser River. And they said, well, we've got to do something. There was a dramatic drop off in the, in the 1970s of the numbers of coho salmon that were coming up the river. So they said, we have to do something about this. So they created a, uh, something called the Salmonid Enhancement Program, SEP for short, S-E-P. And the idea was that they uh, the problem was that a lot of the tributaries of the Fraser River that had previously been home to spawning coho were now polluted, blocked up, dis choked with debris, you name it, that was the problem. So they had to restore fisheries and spawning habitat to these valuable tributaries. So we were one of the very first uh, clubs they contacted because we had been in the news for quite a few years about trying to bring back the brunette and not being very successful. So they came to us and said, uh, would you like some help? And we said, we sure would. So um, uh, thereupon our fortunes changed. Um, the federal government, of course, had the muscle. They went to these polluting companies on the lower part of the brunette and said, um, and did tests tested all the effluents that were coming out of those pipes, took them to the labs and came back and said, okay, what you're putting into these, this river, which is a, um, a federally uh, a rated salmon bearing stream, you are polluting this and you've got, uh, you have to get rid of this, right, uh, have to get rid of this or we're going to come down on you heavily. 
So it appeared we don't know exactly what they did, but they came to an agreement. They gave these companies approximately three years to clean up their acts. So uh, as it happened, uh, this was in about 1977. So by 1980, they were, they were monitoring the water quality of the lower Brunette River all this time. The Environment, uh, Environment Canada was working with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And so they, by 1980, they said, the water quality is now good enough in the lower part of the Brunette River. And good enough for salmon. And that's a real turning point in the story. The Sapperton Fish and Game Club acquired thousands of junior coho salmon that they could put in to the lower Burnett River, and so they did. The next big turning point was 1984. Elmer Rudolph had serendipitously just joined the club. I, as it happens, I was the first one to see the salmon coming back. I was not a member of the Sapperton Fish and Game Club at the time. I. Um, I was, uh, I, but I was an ardent fisherman. I used to fish the salmon, the Fraser River all the time for years, uh, doing bar fishing along with other people. And finally I got to the point after f fishing for many years, thinking to myself, well, instead of just taking fish out of the river, maybe I should be doing something to trying to put some, something, some back, doing something to put something back. And um, one of the uh, uh, fellows that I knew, he said, oh, he said, you should, joined the Sappert Fish and Game Club. He said they're a really uh, going organization. And he was a member of the Sappert Fish and Game Club, unbeknownst to me. So I phoned him up and they said, okay, when, when's our next meeting? And their next meeting happened to be in September. And so I went to the first meeting, joined up. And uh, I, uh, in the second meeting, I thought, well, you know, I don't know much about the Burnett River. Maybe I should find out something about this if I'm going to be involved with the club and the club's involved in cleaning it up. So I t went for a walk in uh, early October. Uh, I went for a walk up the Burnett River and I happened to see what uh, seemed to be a swirl in the water. So I investigated a little bit closer and it looked to me like it was a, a salmon. So I walked a little bit further up and there was another swirl and another swirl. So I thought, for sure, these are salmon. The once we have the salmon coming back, a lot of people thought, okay, now we've done our job, but uh, that job had only just begun because um, once we brought the salmon back, we had to keep them alive now. We not only had to keep the spawners alive so that they could spawn successfully and, and produce eggs to produce uh, the next generation, but when that next generation hatched a few months later in the river and in the tributary streams, we had to keep them um, alive for a whole year because the salmon uh, uh, coho juveniles, they have to stay in the, in, the, um, in the stream that they're born in for an entire year before they migrate down to the ocean. So we had to try and keep them alive and healthy for a whole year until they migrated out. And uh, in order to keep them alive, we now had to enlist the help of the community. And that was all the people that lived in the watershed of the Burnett River. And that watershed is quite large. It goes all the way around Burnaby Lake, uh, through Burnaby, Metro Town, into North Burnaby, around Brentwood, um, and around uh, Burnaby Mountain, where Simon Fraser University is, even into Coquitlam and Newestminster. So it's a very large watershed for what appears to be a small river. And um, so uh, the, we asked the uh, people who were, were living in, our, in the watershed to make sure that they did not pollute uh, didn't put any polluting events down there, storm drains and whatnot, so that would get into the river and, and kill the fish. And we were um, we were uh, very conscientious about that. When we, if, even if we would get a report on a Monday night, on a Sunday night at 10 o'clock, we would be out there with our, our flashlights, trying to uh, trying to find out the problem if we could. And. When we would find these polluting events, we would report them to Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Environment Canada, City of Burnaby, those kinds of, uh, um, those kinds of uh, authoritative bodies. And um, I have to say that in our first year or two, we had a lot of polluting events. I would say our, polluting, our pollution would, if we would probably get a one major polluting event, not a major, but a good sized polluting event once a month. That was not uncommon. And gradually we worked it down, worked it down, worked it down, what with public education and, and gradually finding these places that were doing this and finding these people and, and enforcing the pollution laws. I would say right now, today in uh, 2020, 
we have maybe one pollution event worth uh, mentioning to the public about once every five years. So we went from once a month to once every five years, and probably that's about the best we can ex expect right now. That wasn't the end of the story for the Fish and Game Club. There were many threats to come, some expected, some not. Traffic is a continuing problem. There's not much we can do about that. There is no special filters that we have or anything to take care of the pollution that traffic causes. And the pollution that traffic causes is that, first of all, you have brake dust from brake linings. And the brake dust just falls on the road in a very fine, uh, fine layer. And you have a collection of oil drips from thousands and thousands of cars going back and forth on the street. And if you're, if you have not uh, had a rainfall for um, let's say two or three weeks and you have a real dry period for two, three, four weeks and then you get a couple of days of heavy rain. Well, I'll tell you, when you go to the local tributary and you, uh, you know there are storm drains that drain into that tributary, that tributary runs pretty black for eight or ten hours until all that grime and everything is washed off the street. But it is a flash flooding kind of thing. It's something that lasts eight or ten hours and then it's gone. There's not much we can do about it. We just hope that it comes during a period when there are not that many fish in the system. And the, the safest periods, if you want to say the safest periods for that kind of polluting event to happen, is um, through the late spring, through the summer, and into the early fall because that's when uh, our, we have a very low population of migrating fish um, and um, the migrating fish will come up in the October, November time so that's when it's we're most um, concerned about water quality. And now for a threat out of left field which required an amazing public relations effort. Oh interesting story about chloramine, yes. Um, um, we uh, we got a call from a person who used to work with Environment Canada. We had worked with him quite closely on, on pollution events in the Burnett River. And he said, I have to tell you this, he said, the city of Surrey is planning, is using, experimenting with chloramine to disinfect their drinking water rather than chlorine. And he said, I attended a spill of chlorinated water, which is strictly what you'd think of as harmless drinking water from a pipe in Surrey and it ran down the roadway and it ran down for about uh, oh several hundred meters before it got into a storm drain and it went down another several hundred meters and it finally went into a stream and where it entered that stream downstream from there it killed all the fish in that stream so this is this chloramine is powerful stuff well so he went to the city of uh, Surrey and said why uh, you know you should consider not using chloramine Oh yes, well we want to use chloramine because chloramine does not break down in the, in the pipes. Chlorine breaks down, chlorine is affected by bacteria. When it encounters bacteria in the pipes, it breaks down. So that means if we use chloramine, chlorine in our water, every so often down our system we have to have reinforcing stations to uh, reinforce the uh, chlorine. But with chloramine we don't have to do that. We put it once in at the top of the system and it's good all the way down. Yeah, unfortunately, it's good all the way down. It doesn't break down. That was the big advantage of chlorine. If chlorine got loose, break from a water pipe, and broke down and ran down the street, the moment the chlorine hit dirt, any bacteria, anything on the street, it was, it was immediately um, rendered uh, harmless. So that it, could, it could go into a stream where there was fish, and it would not, it would not harm the fish. So... So we went to, so then we got news that the city of Burnaby, a city, not the city of Burnaby, Metro Vancouver was contemplating doing the same thing. So we put on a, a real um, public relations blitz. We went to a whole bunch of uh, the uh, city councils. We went to Newestminster City Council. We went to Burnaby City Council. We went to the Metro Vancouver uh, Water, Water Board. And we gave them the we gave them the spiel that said this is how bad this is, and we've got we're not this is not just our opinion. This is coming from Environment Canada, and we had all the the scientific evidence and everything to say how bad it would be to use chloramine in the water. Oh well, they said no. We can just dump 
Well, if we got a chloramine spill, we can just come along with this bag of stuff that neutralizes and dump it in and it'll neutralize the chloramine. Well, yeah, but you'll get there two, an hour or two year, hours later and neutralize it from that point. But for an hour, the chloramine's been running into the stream, killing all the fish. So that's not going to do it. So we went to, so we kept up the pressure and we got a lot of publicity in the newspapers. So finally, finally, there was a lot of, and we got, I went on to um, uh, an, 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 a CKNW talk show there and talked about it and so we were getting a lot of we were getting a lot of good press about this and people were beginning to ask a lot of questions of Metro Vancouver so finally Metro Vancouver said okay what we're going to do is we're going to hold a series of uh, uh, question and answer forums throughout the lower mainland at about four hotels or whatever and we're going to and we're going to explain to the public what how, what this is all about, and we're going to hear about your concerns. So, they uh, so they said. Um, however, they made a little they made a little uh, 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 rule here. They said all the people who have previously been to microphones complaining about this, and that included me and a bunch of other ones, can't speak. You can't speak. It'll be for the members of the public only to speak. Okay, so. That was fine. So we went to the we went to the first meeting. It was a big at a big hotel by Guildford in Surrey. Oh, a couple of hundred people there, and they talked about their plans. Well, I'll tell you, I don't think they were expecting what the re, what the response was. People were coming up to the microphone and said, "I don't. We don't care if we. It's going to cost us a hundred or two hundred dollars more." for chlorine because now we have to we have to create all these reinforcing stations and everything all the way down the line which is going to cost money whereas chloramine we just put it in at the top and it goes all the way down it's cheaper people are saying we don't care if it's cheaper if it's going to kill a fish we don't want it and 10 year old kids were coming up to the microphone and saying the same thing and they the, the people from the metro vancouver water board they got a real earful well, there were three more of these to be held around the Lower Mainland. I didn't go to any more of them, but I knew what was happening. And they, they went to, they had all, not all four of them. And finally, they got the message. They got the message, so they went home, and we didn't hear anything for about two months. And all of a sudden, we got a, we got a message, we got a news announcement from Metro Vancouver. They would not only be discontinuing the, uh, the, the thought of using chloramine. They would go to chlorine, but they would go to a state-of-the-art uh, disinfection system for our uh, reservoirs, where our water was coming from, and use a state-of-the-art disinfection system plus chlorine and to use in our, in our water systems. And so that was a huge victory for us, and I remember uh, in our local paper, our, our reporter, who had been one of the local newspaper reporters who had been talking to me about this quite a bit, he had a, he had a column in there, and the head of the column says, Rudolph wins. <laughs> so that was pretty good. So anyway, yes, that was, <clears throat> that was a major victory, a major victory for us. And uh, I think we were surprised that, uh, that the effect we had, but I think what surprised us the most was the fact, was the fact that the the public was so much on our side and once once Metro Vancouver heard about that and they said we don't care if it's going to cost us another hundred or two hundred dollars a year we don't want this we don't want chloramine that's going to kill all our fish so that was the that was the feedback they got and that was a big victory a big victory for us yeah I asked Elmer how many fish come back to the river every year uh, as far as the numbers of salmon that come up the Burnett River, uh, as I said, in the, the, the coho first came back in 1984, and we've had a uh, return of salmon come back every year since 1984. Some years better, some years worse, but every year since 1984. We, re we introduced chum into the river, which was a historical uh, salmon into the Burnett River, along with coho, in about 1986. And uh, the chum, um, the chum uh, recovery of chum into the river has been very successful over the years, to the point that we no longer enhance chum in the in the Burnett River. We still enhance coho, because coho are a particularly difficult species 
to enhance because of the fact that they're much more sensitive to water conditions than the chum are. So the chum, we stopped um, enhancing chum several years ago, but the chum numbers um, are good. Uh, uh, right now, I would say a typical return, what we would consider a good return of coho into the Burnett River system would be about 300 coho a year. Um, and over the, uh, up until the last couple of years, we had a really good spike of chum salmon. Uh, this is 2020, I would say back around 19, uh, 2016, 2017, we had as many as 5,000 chum come up the Burnett River, which was terrific. And they were going way up, the, up into the watershed trying to find places to spawn because there were so many of them going into tiny little ditches and streams that nobody had ever seen fish in before. Um, and, but the, the, uh, the, uh, we've had, uh, in the last couple of years, a lot fewer come back. But still, I think this year we were down to about 200 uh, chum come back. But like I said, we have had highs of up to 5,000. But that's not a problem with the Burnett River. That's a problem with the great Pacific Ocean out there where the chum salmon are, have, had, uh, have had some problems. And so, um, so that's, there's nothing much we can do about that. But by and large, the numbers are satisfactory, and um, we're still working hard to to try and enhance coho numbers because they're always a problem. They take a lot more work than all the other all the others do. The other, the third uh, salmon species that is historically came back in the Burnett is our pink salmon. We're still and we're working hard to try and we're working hard to try and uh, continue to enhance them, but we're not having nearly as much luck. We've been working for a good 10 years to enhance pink salmon. Right now the numbers are still quite low, um, but we're still working hard to enhance them. And who knows, one year we we'll may suddenly have a breakthrough like we did with the chum and find that, uh, that uh, uh, pink salmon are finally a success. But uh, we're soldiering on right now. We have all three species coming back and we're by no means uh, out of the uh, we're no, by no means uh, out of the dark. We still have to work to do, but, um, but so far the, the program and the project uh, is still working and continues on. And with our hatchery that we have uh, uh, had working since 1977, where we uh, enhance our coho uh, from, and we take approximately 20,000 coho fry a year from that hatchery and put them into the brunette system. Uh, so we're still working there. Um, um, uh, but as it happened, that just this last year we had, we had, uh, it was not a very good year for coho uh, coming back at all. So we didn't want to disrupt the, the spawning of the wild coho numbers, so we did not take any salmon co coho out of the, out of the uh, numbers coming back, back, to our, uh, back to our hatchery. So we just wanted to let the, the numbers, just, uh, the wild numbers just go as they were. But that's only the second year, it's only the second year in our 22nd year history that we have not taken coho salmon. The last year was in 2012, when it, we also had a poor run. But other than that, we uh, are taking, and we expect next year will be better, and we'll be back to taking salmon again, and the, and, and the hatchery will be back in operation. Ever wondered how they count the salmon? I asked Elmer. Uh, <coughs> We have, as I tell people, we have two ways of counting salmon. One is kind of a high-tech way, and the other one is the same old one, two, three, four, as we see them in the stream. Um, we started a few years ago. Um, um, we put a, we have a, at the top end of our um, fishway, at the top end of the Burnett River, where the fish go over the um, Caribou Dam into Burnaby Lake and into the upper part of the watershed where quite a number of fish go. We, uh, several years ago, put a, uh, what we'd call a trap in there. It's not really a trap, more like a collecting box and the water flows through it. And when the fish come into that box, they trip a little trip wire, which turns on a camera. And the camera uh, can determine, can see what species of fish it is whether it's a female or a male, and whether it's ready to spawn or not spawn. And that goes to a recorder in the building, and then we can turn on that recorder uh, from uh, remotely online, and we can see how many fish are going through and what time of day they're going through and all the rest of it, and we can keep those records. So that's really a big help for us, a big help for us. The other method of counting that I mentioned, um, we are, are 
uh, best spawning and rearing tribu tributary uh, going off the Burnett River is Stony Creek. And there is a separate streamkeepers group. Because Stony Creek is such a major project, we have, there's a separate streamkeepers group that looks after Stony uh, Creek and has looked after Stony Creek now for a good 20 years. And they, um, they uh, send out volunteers and they, uh, because it's a lot, because the, in some, a lot of places the stream is only two or three meters wide, it's a lot easier to count the fish. So, uh, so they will send crews out to count the fish and uh, they will break down the, the stream into sections and each crew uh, is responsible for counting fish in a section and they all go out at the same time. So, uh, so they, they count their fish and they add them up and um, they come up with their totals and they're, they're, it's quite an effective way of doing it. There have been many groups who have wondered how it is that you can bring back a dead urban river to life. Elmer has some clues. In order to keep the fish uh, healthy and happy in our river or in our stream, and as a matter of fact, in, in any rivers, or particularly in any st spawning streams around the whole lower mainland here where there's liable to be salmon or trout in there, they need five things. The first thing they need is clean water. Have to have clean water. Just like we have to have clean air to breathe, they have to have clean water. The second thing they have to have is that water has to have oxygen in it. It has to have oxygen in it uh, because that's how the fish get their, get their air. And that's what their gills are for, to take the oxygen out of the water. And so that means the stream has to have a combination of what we call riffles and pools, where the riffles are, are, water, are rocks where the water tumbles over, and as the water tumbles over and frosts, it picks up air oxygen from the air. So that's vital in a stream that it has that kind of ability to create oxygen that the fish that the fish um, uh, that the fish need. The, um, the uh, another thing that they need is they need um, the water needs to be cool. The water needs to be cool. Salmon hate most fish hate warm water, particularly salmon. They hate warm water. They don't want to live in a stream there where the water is warm. Now, the way we can do that, the best way we can do that, is to make sure that we have trees and shrubs sheltering our streams and our rivers to the best we can. And we call that a tree canopy. We encourage the trees to come up and grow and the branches to go right up over top where the leaves cover and provide 100% shade if possible. That's the best, 100% shade. But the highest percentage of shade we can get, the better. Um, and the and of course, in that water, the fish have to have food. They have to have food um, because, and they get those food, that food, some, some of it is from insects in the water and, that live and, uh, and uh, multiply in the water. The other part is they get insects that fall off the trees. The trees contain a lot of insects and the insects fall off the trees and that's part of their food chain. So the trees form uh, a double, uh, have double value there, providing cool water and also food. The last item they need is they have to be safe. So in some areas of those rivers and streams you have to have deep pools where the fish can go down deep into the water and stay away from predators. Predators like eagles, um, osprey which might take them, um, even uh, animals on the streams like otters. Otters will go after them. They have to have a, a way to coyotes, any any weasels, anything like that that would prey on the fish on the side in the shallow water. They need those spots of deep water where they can go and get um, shelter from predators. So those are the five must-haves to um, to raise fish to have fish uh, be successful in your local streams. What can your family do, or more precisely, not do, to help save salmon-bearing streams near you? I said the first thing you can do is make sure you do not throw down your gutter or down the storm drain in the back lane behind your house if you live there. Don't get rid of any paint. That was a popular thing to do. Oh, just get rid of the paint, pour it down here. Uh, don't get rid of your car oil. If you change your own car oil, don't put the car oil down there. Um, things like that. Don't, don't wash your car with soapy water on the street. Because guess where? That soapy water goes down the storm drain, the nearest storm drain, and all those storm drains eventually end up through a series of pipes in the Brunette River. So you can't get away from it. So 
So if you're going to wash your car with soapy water, wash it on the grass or on the gravel area somewhere where the soapy water will so soak into the ground and the wa that soapy water will never get into the Burnett River. So that's, the, that's one of the major things I say to people, how you can help. Preserving nature and the earth takes the dedication and perseverance of a few individuals. After all, nature is our home and our source of life. It's also the place of all creatures large and small fish, birds, plants, trees, large animals, small animals, all of the interconnected life that makes our planet so beautiful and viable. Thank you to every one of you who are working to preserve life on this planet. Life is precious, We've got to remember that. My special gratitude to Elmer Rudolph and all his colleagues at the Sapperton Fish and Game Club for all your work. And thank you so much for telling the story to us, Elmer. Once again, I'm Susan Miller. I'm with New Westminster Community Television. You can find us on a website, www.newwest.tv. Hope to see you there.